That's right, the connections between the Westerosi legends of Dawn and the Last Hero and the Far Eastern legends of the Bloodstone Emperor and Azor Ahai aren't just a matter of being similar stories with similar elements. As any of you who have watched my Great Empire of the Dawn series will know, thank you everyone, what we're talking about here is an ancient dragon lord civilization which existed in Ashai before the Long Night and before Valyria and which came to Westeros before and during the Long Night. As dramatic as that may sound at first, we've actually been hearing that there might be dragons in the Shadowlands beyond Ashai ever since the first book. And in the World of Ice and Fire, we learned that Septon Barth says that the ancient Ashai might have taught the Valerians how to control and bond with dragons. And I more or less think that that is exactly right. This lost Ashai Dragonlord civilization was, I believe, the same one the ancient scrolls of Yi-T name as the Great Empire of the Dawn. And we can surmise that they were Dragonlords because they appear to have built infused stone, just like the Valerians after them. So far as we know, fused black stone, which is also called Dragonstone, can only be created with sorcery and dragonfire. So it's a pretty conclusive case. The five forts are supposedly made of slab walls of fused stone hundreds of feet high. And there are five of them. The Great Empire of the Dawn are also pretty much the only suspect for the building of the fused stone fortress beneath the high tower at Old Town, which is one of the big pieces of proof that they came to Westeros in ancient day, long before Valyria ever arose. None other than Daenerys Targaryen sees a vision of what appear to be the gemstone-associated emperors of this lost Dragonlord Empire, the Great Empire of the Dawn, in her Wake the Dragon dream in A Game of Thrones, and they make quite the entrance. Ghosts lined the hallway, dressed in the faded raiment of kings. In their hands were swords of pale fire. They had hair of silver and hair of gold and hair of platinum white, and their eyes were opal and amethyst, tourmaline and jade. First of all, hat tip to my friend Durin Durandan, who first made this great find. Now, all of these kingly ghosts, they have dragon lord hair, right? Silver, gold, and platinum white. And the one with amethyst eyes would essentially be a perfect Valerian or Targaryen. The other eye colors, however, were never seen among the Valerians. And the four gemstones named here turn out to exactly match four of the eight gemstone emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn, Opal, Amethyst, tourmaline, and jade. Not only do these kingly ghosts kind of look like dragon lords, and not only do they want Danny to wake the dragon, well, look, they're holding swords of pale fire. And that means that they're being implied not only as dragon lords, but as highly skilled mages and sorcerers, and quite possibly very advanced bladesmiths. Obviously, flaming swords and dragon lords make us think of Azor High. What is this, like his family or something? Well, yeah, basically that's, that's what I'm saying. Yeah, this is Azor Ahai's family. The prophecy of Azor Ahai being reborn to wake dragons from stone does, after all, make a lot more sense when you realize that the original Azor Ahai came from the lands of the Great Empire of the Dawn, which was a dragon lord civilization. That means it's overwhelmingly likely that the first Azor Ahai was a dragon lord, just as Azor Ahai reborn candidates Danny and John are or will be dragon lords. Similarly, it makes sense to think about Azor Ahai wielding a sword of magical fire when we think of these gemstone emperors as his ancestors and kinsmen. Clearly, they possessed the knowledge of flaming sword sorcery. So now, thinking about the sword Dawn once more, a pale, luminous meteorite sword, which could be Lightbringer, a sword completely anachronistic in first man dominated Westeros. Could these swords of pale fire in the hands of the emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn indicate a link to the sword Dawn? Can Dawn light up with pale fire, and were these the people who made it? I mean, if we're looking for people who can make a substance similar to Valyrian steel before the existence of Valyria, the Great Empire of the Dawn certainly fits the bill as an advanced, pre-long night, dragonlord civilization. After all, if the original Azor High did indeed come to Westeros, as seems likely, and if Dawn is Lightbringer, then that basically just means that Azor Ahai left his sword in Westeros. The story that emerges then is that Azor Ahai's Lightbringer came from the Great Empire of the Dawn all the way to Westeros to win the War for the Dawn in the hands of the last hero, and was then probably renamed Dawn the Sword of the Morning. It was also remembered in the annals of the Night's Watch as a sword of dragon steel, which it certainly was. 
I think you'll agree that this forms the backbone of a somewhat coherent narrative about the past and pretty neatly unites these very similar Eastern and Western legends about the Long Night. Another clue about Dawn and Lightbringer being the same sword or very similar related swords can be found in the other names of Azor Ahai. That's right, there are other names for Azor Ahai. How long the darkness endured, no man can say, but all agree that it was only when a great warrior, known variously as Hercoon the Hero, Azor Ahai, Yin Tar, Nefarion, and Eldric Shadow Chaser, arose to give courage to the race of men and lead the virtuous into battle with his blazing sword Lightbringer that the darkness was put to rout, and light and love returned once more to the world. The names Eldric Shadow Chaser and Hercoon the Hero are very clear nods to Michael Moorcock's Elric of Melnibone book series, which Martin has credited as being a large influence on his own writing. Elric of Melnibone is a dragon-riding hero, or perhaps anti-hero, with a black, blood-drinking, magically flaming dragon sword called Stormbringer. Stop me when any of this sounds familiar. Elric is also an emaciated, nihilistic, white-haired albino sorcerer who's kept alive by psychedelic drugs and magic. And yeah, this should remind you of Blood Raven. And of course, it turns out that Blood Raven and Elric both draw influence from the Norse god Odin, as I documented in Odin Origins Blood Raven, which you should definitely watch. Elric of Melnibone also has a sinister cousin, Ir Kun, who contests against Elric with a matching black dragon sword called Mornblade. That's right, Sword of the Morning. Mornblade, you're catching on. And this is why another of Azor Ahai's names is Hercoon the Hero. Then, to tie all this back to House Dane and Westeros, George left a couple of Eldric name variants in the family tree of House Dane. There's Edric Dane, who appears in the main story as the squire of Beric, don't call me Azor Ahai Dondarrion, and also Ulric Dane, a sword of the morning from the time of Daemon Blackfire. Eldric Shadow Chaser, in other words, could be the Westerosi name for Azor Ahai and or the last hero, if those are the same people or related people. And the last hero is, of course, remembered as having chased the white shadows away. Shadow Chaser. Chasing the white shadows. Yeah, pretty good, right? Eldric Shadow Chaser may have also been the first Dane. I'll also point out that the precedent of two matching dragon swords, Stormbringer and Mornblade, suggests that Dawn could have some long-lost twin out there, perhaps the first black dragonsteel sword. I've often speculated about a black sword made from the Bloodstone Emperor's black meteorite to sort of rival Dawn being made from a pale meteorite stone. So keep your eyes on, say, Longclaw, the swords made from Ned's Ice, Widow's Wail, and Oathkeeper, and especially the Targaryen ancestral sword Blackfire, if and when it appears in the story, which I expect it to. Elric's Stormbringer, you see, is a black sword graven with red runes, and when it lights on fire, it lights up with black fire laced with red. This is undoubtedly where George got the notion to have his black dragons, like Balerion and Drogon, breathe black fire shot through with red. And that, of course, is where the sword Blackfire gets its name, from the black fire of the Black Dragons. Another of Martin's major influences, J.R.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings, pops its head up to get a word in here about the Danes and star swords. Isn't that nice? The Danes seem to be, in many ways, based on the Dúnedain, who fled the fall of Númenor, which, by the way, is very equivalent to the Great Empire of the Dawn as a fallen Atlantis-type civilization. The Dúnedain fled Númenor and founded a new house in Middle-earth, just as I'm proposing House Dane would have fled the Great Empire of the Dawn to come to Westeros around the time of the Long Night. The Dúnedain are filled with references to Venus mythology, just like the Danes are, and they've got a couple of magic swords laying around too. Hey guys, post-production LML breaking in here with a bit more on Tolkien's magic swords that I think you guys will like. Yes, in my zeal to summarize and keep things short, I think I cut out some of the best stuff. So check this out. The Dúnedain king who led the flight from Númenor was named Elendil, who used the sword Narsil. And that's the same one which was broken by Sauron, but was then used by Elendil's son Isildur to cut the One Ring from Sauron's hand. And then, of course, it was much later used by Aragorn in The Lord of the Rings. 
Now, Narsil means red and white flame, which of course has to make us think of Lightbringer, the flaming red sword of heroes, as well as the white sword, Dawn, which may of course be Lightbringer. The way Narsil was broken and reforged also reminds me of the last hero breaking his first sword against the cold of the others, but then later emerging with his sword of dragon steel to defeat the others and win the war for the dawn. Finally, note that Narsil was forged in Numenor, but saved by the Dúnedain and then brought to Middle-earth, just as Dawn and or Lightbringer may have been forged in the Great Empire of the Dawn, but then brought to Westeros. Then, going a little further back into history, and by the way, this is all from the Silmarillion and Children of Hurin, we find the dark tale of the dark elf Eol, who first invents a new kind of unbreakable dark steel, which sounds almost exactly like Valyrian steel, and then later forges two twin black swords from a meteorite. There's Anglical, which means Iron of the Flaming Star, and Anguirel, which means Iron of the Eternal Star. And please have mercy on me, Tolkien experts, if I'm mispronouncing any of this. I don't speak Kenya, which is the elvish language of Tolkien. In any case, Anglical and Anguirel are absolutely the best swords in all of Tolkien lore, due to their unique meteoric origin and Eol's advanced smithing skill. But they're also cursed with Eol's malice. That's right. Anglical in particular is used tragically by Turin Turambar in the accidental slaying of his best friend Beleg. Turin later has Anglical reforged by the dwarves and renames it Gurthang, and then whoops so much ass with it that Turin is actually nicknamed the Black Sword. And one thinks of Ned Stark's ancestor, Barth Blacksword Stark, who wielded ice. Now, so fearsome is the power of Gurthang that Turin is able to use it to slay the dragon Glaurung, and Gurthang actually runs with pale flame along its edges and even blazes up occasionally in battle. So clearly the magical twin black swords Anglical and Anguirel are the inspiration for the twin black swords Stormbringer and Mornblade, especially when you consider that Stormbringer is similarly cursed and essentially slays Elric's love, Cimmeril, by acting with a will of its own, even while in Elric's hands, which is pretty similar to the tale of Turin and Beleg. And it's even more similar to Aeol the Dark Elf slaying his elven wife Aradel, which he did while trying to slay his own son instead. He's, he's a dark elf, remember, he's not a very nice guy. And by the way, his son Meglin had stolen Anguirel from Eol. So all these black swords are cursed, and of course don't forget that Valerian steel is almost certainly forged with human sacrifice and blood magic, just as Lightbringer was, which means those swords may well be cursed too. And it's also worth noting that Lightbringer was said to drink not only the blood of Nissa, Nissa but her soul as well even as Stormbringer drinks the souls of those it slays, such as the unfortunate Cimmeril. In other words, it seems pretty clear at this point that Elric's slaying of Cimmeril with Stormbringer, Turin's slaying of Beleg with Anglical, and Eol's slaying of Aradel in an incident that involved Anguirel are some of the primary, if not the primary, influences on the legend of Azor Ahai slaying Nissa Nissa to forge Lightbringer. And if Lightbringer is a meteor sword, either Dawn itself or a black sword made from the Bloodstone Emperor's black meteorite, then we would have to see it as being very similar to the black meteor swords Anglical and Anguirel. Once again, I hope you can see why I keep talking about the possibility of two magic swords being wrapped up in the Lightbringer mythology. And overall, I hope you can see that the legend of Azor Ahai, Nissa Nissa, and Lightbringer doesn't exactly come out of left field, but instead draws on a series of stories about cursed swords, black swords, meteor swords, and flaming swords from Tolkien and Moorcock, with Moorcock being influenced by Tolkien and George essentially keeping the tradition going and adding his own spin. And now back to the previously recorded script where I was talking about the Danes being similar to the Dúnedain. The Dúnedain are also the ones who built the Tower of Orthanc, whose black stone is described in almost exactly the same terms as the fused black stone that the Valerians are known for, which means that Orthanc may in fact be the inspiration for the fused black dragon stone. Honestly, it's a really cool and detailed correlation that deserves your full attention, so be sure to check out the video Great Empire of the Dawn Westeros for the full details. I just mentioned that Eldrick Shadow Chaser could be the Westeros name for the last hero, who could be the first Dane, and that would imply that the Danes again, come from the east, right? We can also turn to 
fantasy world genetics, such as they are, to find evidence that House Dane is actually a legacy of Azor High and other great Empire of the Dawn people coming to Westeros. Several members of House Dane in the main story very curiously show us silver hair and purple eye traits, despite having no Targaryen or Valerian blood. A Shara Dane has the purple eyes, and Edric and Gerald Darkstar Dane both have the eyes and the hair. We've seen in Danny's vision that the emperors of the Great Empire of the Dawn had the signature Dragonlord hair, and at least some had the purple eyes. So now we have an explanation for these features appearing in the line of House Dane. What all this means is that the Danes essentially share a common ancestor with Valeria, which has actually been a fan theory long before we ever heard of the Great Empire of the Dawn in the World of Ice and Fire. It also means that the Sword Dawn is almost certainly a legacy of the Great Empire's magical sword-making ability. Having either been made in the East and brought West, or perhaps made in the West with knowledge from the East. If Dawn is from the Great Empire of the Dawn, then that means it's probably either Lightbringer or perhaps Lightbringer's twin in a sort of two-sword Lightbringer scenario, such as we just discussed. So to sum up, on opposite sides of the world, we have very similar stories about the Long Night, both of which involve a magical meteorite and a hero with a shining or flaming sword who ends the Long Night. The stories have much and more to suggest that they are connected, which means that Martin is trying to tell us that the Long Night has something to do with falling stars. Perhaps they're just things to make swords with. Meteor swords are well established in Tolkien lore and other fantasy after all, but perhaps they're also the mysterious trigger mechanism for the Long Night. The question then becomes, where did these potential falling stars come from? And the answer to that is found, of course, in more Old Eastern legends. So look, as you probably have heard by now, part four is called Moon Dragons, so I'm kind of spoiling things a bit as far as the question of where did the meteors come from? They came from the moon, okay? That's, that's why we have a moon meteors drinking game around these parts. And yes, we did get a tiny bit lost in the weeds there talking about magic swords, but if you want to put me on trial for waxing poetic about Gurthang and Stormbringer, well, go right ahead. I've no defense. Hope you enjoyed all that, but in part four, it's time to get serious about causing the long night, so check that out tomorrow if you're watching these on the day they come out. And to you brave souls watching this from the future, you're all set. Just check out the playlist in the description below. Also, what's the future like? Do we have teleportation yet? Time travel? Most importantly, is Winds of Winter out? Was I right about the comet coming back and causing the long night? Did I get super famous for predicting it? Uh, oh, I see. Some guy on Reddit stole my theory and got all the credit. Ah. No, I'm just kidding. But this is the future you can prevent, my friends, by helping me grow my YouTube channel with your comments on the video, your likes, and you recommending my sort of eccentric symbolism guy brand to all of your friends. Thanks in advance, and I'll see you next time.